Anyway, what do we do if we don't protect the banks in, the next, in this credit crisis and the next credit crisis? And I know you may hate it, you'll hate the lack of competition, understand all that, but a community conversation is, when are you actually cutting your nose off to spite your face? And what the US Treasurer said in 1931 when he was told about the bank's stupidity and greed, he said, and I quote, that will teach the bastards. He did nothing, and it did. 84% of the US banking system collapsed. Unemployment rate hit 26%. And if you were in a bank that had not collapsed, you were on rations. How much you could take out was rationed each week. Guess who really, yeah, and by the way, the bankers didn't get bonuses and didn't get a job, and we can all applaud that. But for each person we punish possibly justifiably as a community, have we made a good community decision? No, we haven't. Because 99.9% .9 of us aren't bankers and we get smashed as well. So basically what, um, what Milton Friedman says in his 1951 book is come the next credit crunch, it's dreadfully simple. There are three rules and I'll save you reading 560 pages. The three rules are whether you like it or not, as a community, you save the banks, you save the banks and you save the banks. Now, we all did it around the world in different ways. In our case, our banks were so solid, a guarantee did the trick. But if you're wondering about our solid banks, by the way, there came the night there 18 months ago where our banks were dry of $100 notes. I came home and said to my wife, uh, I came back from Canberra, said, you're going to believe it. Uh, you know, the banks are basically out of big denomination bills. There's no drama, you know, more will get shipped in. But people aren't queuing, but they're going in an orderly basis and taking cash out. And my wife, Vicky, who's a smart girl, Vicky said, lucky I got in first. I said, what do you mean? And she said, I went down to the bank this morning and took out a relatively large amount of money and brought it home in the back of the car. And uh, I said, where is it? She said, it's in the, in the safe in your wine cellar. And I said, for God's sake, don't tell anyone. Um, that actually was the night the guarantee was announced. Guess what my wife did the next morning? Put the money back in the car and took it back to the bank. <laughs> I, anyway, it's, 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 psychology is fascinating, isn't it? That actually is a community conversation. So as a global community, we had a conversation. And we actually spoke about the fact that the long debt economists were right, that by the Americans bailing out the banking sector, they were going to get, the politicians are going to get smashed for rewarding greed and all the things you may or may not, the perceptions probably closer than the reality, by the way, all sorts of things that the news, make newspaper headlines. But basically, English effectively nationalised. In Australia, we were lucky enough just to put a guarantee. I mean, one thing that really does make me laugh, that the press hasn't mentioned, by the way, do you realise that the Australian government, when they guaranteed the banks and all our money rushed back in, do you realise that we actually couldn't pay that guarantee out anyway? <laughs> so it's all about confidence. So it's really quite fun. Now, into your local community. What sort of stuff can I, can I interest you in? Well, look, I, I think the, the thing that I can talk about that is factually based, not emotionally based, is, and probably it's about the only thing I can talk to you about factually based, I can give you anecdotes about property prices, I can give you anecdotes about why we went from south of Oka to north of Oka, so I can get my towel out on the beach on Christmas Day. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can say, well, gee whiz, you know, for us, we can really no longer afford to drive to Avoca, you know, in the afternoons during the week. For those of you who tried to get, luckily I got here a little early and I was able to just duck down and make sure the beach house is okay. And much to my pleasure, at about, I guess about 5.30, I drove from Terrigal back to the Erina Centre and on the other side of the road, if you were there, you probably still are there. So we can talk about that's an infrastructure issue. But again, as a community, if you decide to turn that, and I noticed, by the way, towards Terrigal, there actually are some signs up, so there is some two-lane road going in. But as a community, is that how you want to allocate your resources? You know, do you want to make that? And that, I imagine that's a damn big bite, is it not, if you were to do that? It looks to me like you've got to resume housing, and if you resume housing, you're going to tick off a whole bunch of people in the community. You are going to allocate resources to that. Now, why are you doing that? Are you doing that so Paul and Vicky can get to their beach house faster of an afternoon? That's probably a bad decision, isn't it? These are difficult community decisions. I could argue if the infrastructure was better in that fashion and we could somehow bulldoze East Gosford so I'd get the evoker even faster, and that's a different conversation altogether, that I might come here more often and spend more money in the local community, good or bad. From my viewpoint, vested interest, you know, it's, uh, it's like the story of the, you know, the, the great country story of the councillor where the bitumen road finishes outside their place. Uh, it's one of the very popular stories in my hometown of Griffith. Whether it's true or not, I've got no idea, but it's a very popular story. But basically, you know, these are, these are complex community issues because where we're not very good as a community is we actually want to have terrific community conversations but not in our backyard. And that's a real issue. It makes it very hard for, you know, Eddie and his team actually getting stuff done, are you ever going to get 100% agreement on anything? No. 
Now, John Howard said to me one day, son, you've all got this all wrong. If 49% hate me, I'm doing well. Uh, but councils don't like 49% hating them. Um, so basically, it's very difficult to get things done when we listen to people. Uh, you know, it's great we listen to people, but in a way, it makes things harder. I mean, what sort of community do you want to be? A mate of mine, I'm ducking over to visit in a few weeks. I've got some stuff to do in Washington. And um, I'm going to go via Dallas and visit one of my uni mates who works with a uh, company called Accor over there, the hotel chain, pretty um, senior, senior role. He lives in a suburb of Dallas and um, uh, many American companies. Here's a decision for you, community issue. Many American companies have moved head offices to Dallas. Why? Because Dallas said we'll do two things. We'll lower our state tax for you. We'll provide you with electricity subsidies and we'll provide you with building subsidies. If you will come bring your head office here and you will be here for a set number of period of time. And the head office has all said, great, but if we move with a thousand people, where are they going to live? And Dallas said, not a problem, we will just build a new suburb, which they did build in four years for a million people. Now, how the heck did they do that? Well, basically, I, I turned up there some years ago to watch this in action. I rather like uh, Americans. Now, here we have uh, an issue that will probably cause most of us to tear our hair, to be quite honest with you, is they said, we as a community want this. We want the head offices. We will get long-term benefits. Eventually, they will come up to paying normal rates, normal electricity, but we will get a million new people. Those million new people will be younger people, typically the execs, you know, 30 to 45-ish, maybe 50. And basically, we're going to get a more dynamic community. We're going to get more support for the culture and the arts, and we are going to have a better community. This is a Dallas community conversation. Now, how do you build a new suburb of a million people? Well, the Americans are a bit lucky. They've got a fair bit of real estate. So what they did is they basically just got out the D4s, and in four years, the first thing they did was they just rolled over everything and built a four-lane freeway in each direction, plus another four lanes out to the airport, which is the other side of this new suburb. And I said, but, but what do you do if you see the, the spotted bell tree frog? And my American project manager said to me, oh, Paul, we really respect the environment and history, so what we do is if we see this spotted bell frog, we stop the bulldozers, we take a photo, we hang it in the museum, and we roll the bastard. <laughs> um, now, sorry, community conversation. If you want a million people in a suburb with facilities, and when the Americans build a high school, by the way, they automatically build a football stadium with a 15,000 seat grandstand. It's a beautiful suburb. If there was a spotted bell tree frog, it's now underground, okay? But you're not gonna, get, now, this, and I'm using the poor, I don't, know, I don't know if a spotted bell tree exists, by the way, I wouldn't have a clue. I'm trying to make an example of the conversations you need to have. They had that conversation, and, and that city believes it's working in cultural, artistic vibrancy, and so on. We can reserve, go, go and visit yourself, make your own decision. So basically, one of the things you can't control is I read, going down to the Gosford level now, I, I read your website um, last night, and I, I, I loved it. Uh, I saw that the, the dominant thought was lifestyle, agree with that? And I love this one, is the dominant thought was you want to be a caring country town. That's really nice. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Why won't it happen? Because you're not a country town. It, but that was the dominant, and I love that message by the way. I live in Kirribilli in Sydney and I talk about my village very proudly. Not the person who got murdered down the end of the street, because that doesn't kind of fit my little sort of village story, okay? So basically, I, I like, I'm in Kirribilli, in fact we call it the Kirribilli Village. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's how we feel is important in our community. But the issue you guys, and when I say guys, can I, can I, all of us, I'm not being sexist. So basically the issue here though is it's not just me noticing more people at Evoca, noticing it's hard to get to Evoca in the traffic in Terrigal, and parking in Terrigal, goodness gracious me, I was a parachute in on Sunday. But um, another infrastructure issue, isn't it? I don't, you know, maybe we don't, maybe we want less people at Terrigal. You know, maybe therefore having, you know, who knows, don't know, not my problem, not my issue. It is my problem, not my issue. So, you know, really interesting. Now, the numbers I got off your website, by the way, and I, I do appreciate this issue here about what's why on council, what's Gosford council, and so on. And, uh, but the number the website talks about very early on, uh, and my, my mate Anthony O'Brien, who's here tonight, one of my, one of my colleagues, is talking about 320,000. I think that's Gosford and Wyong, isn't it? And, but the website talks about 280,000, so I'll, I'll go with what is there in writing, and then people who check it can see it. But it really is interesting, uh, but what this does say, it, it says the, the population here, no wonder Evoca's busier, 4.3% per annum over the last three decades population growth. Now you're thinking, ah, oh, 4.3, you know, 4.3 is not really a lot. If you're growing at 4.3% per annum, how long does it take your population to double? 
And now I'll give you a money tip. Rule of 72. If you want to know when anything will double, put it into 72. So if you're getting 10% per annum, which you won't be, because someone is telling you that'll rip you off, but if you were getting 10% per annum, when would your money double in value if you don't pay fees or taxes? Divide it into 72, 10 into 72, 7.2 years, your money will double in value. That's the rule of 72. So we put 4.3% into 72, if it was to continue, how long before your population doubles? Mental arithmetic, mental arithmetic. I'd say about 4.3, 4 16, I'd say about 16 and a half years. Roughly, close enough, maybe a couple of months more. So basically, if this 280 number that I've got off the website, do I think at only 4.3%, is it feasible that your population is 560,000 people in just 16 years? That smells completely wrong to me. And in fact, your website, particularly in the Gosford area, says population growth will slow. And a lot of that, of course, is, I imagine, available land for housing and so on. Uh, we can kind of see we're running out of space. And if we're all going to live in high rises, I don't think this is the community we want to live in. It doesn't sound like our caring country community, does it? So basically, I don't think you will be when I'm, I'm 55. So do I think when I'm 71, this population is going to double from whatever the number is now? Doesn't seem right to me. Or if it is, I'm going to need to buy a helicopter or a boat to get to Avoca because the road ain't just going to get me there. So I think 4.3% is a huge number. If we try and common sense that number, what do we think is realistic? Well, demographic folk are saying that basically we're likely to be, and we are by the way, likely to be about 35 million people um, in about 25 years. And we think to ourselves, well gee, 35 million people, where are they going to live? Well interestingly, if you got your pro rata number of those, you'd actually be about 420,000 people. But this, this is not 16 years, of course. We're right now out. We're out now some 25 years. And that, you know, that growth rate, I can kind of go, in other words, you're simply getting your fair share of each new Australian. Where are they coming from? Look, it's not just the immigration issue. I swear this boat stuff is such nonsense. I mean, seriously, you're, going to, you know, seriously, you're better off buying yourself a plane ticket and staying too long, for heaven's sake. But anyway, it's a political issue. And um, I'll stay off that one. But the hit point here is that last year, I can tell you a fact, we did grow by 562,000 people. Not many of them were boat people, believe me. 562,000, and this is a, a community story I don't understand. Because certainly for Vicky and myself, um, you know, the, the, the most significant event in a, any community is population growth and death rate. And the big issue for communities really around the world, in first world countries, really changed in 1960 with the introduction of the pill changed things dramatically. Your great-great-grandparents, certainly mine, were each of 10 grandparents, were 10, 10, big numbers. Uh, then myself, my wife in the 19, um, when did we have started having children? 1980s, we had three children. And honestly, my friends thought we actually didn't know what contraception was. Like, three children, that's outrageous. And um, it's kind of funny because, you know, you talk to people 10, 15 years ago, I go back to my old university quite a bit, doing a bit of lecturing, and. Uh, you know, say to kids 15 years ago, you know, how many children would you have? And you, know, you, you tend to get one, two, none, whatever. But basically, it's really fascinating. And some community conversations happen that we don't understand. Because the birth rate has gone up dramatically over the last 10 years. And anyone who says it's due to the government's $5,000 baby bonus has just lost the plot completely. But basically, children, your children, uh, my children, having children again. And we don't quite know why. We, we, we didn't plan for that. You know, we were talking about practically a shrinking Australian population if it wasn't for immigration. In actual fact, we had significant net positive birth rate last year. That, by that I mean births over deaths. The other issue is less of us are dying. And given I turned 55 recently, I'm strongly in support of this. My children think I should be euthanised at 80. But um, <laughs> we'll put that aside for a minute. Uh, but basically, it's really fascinating. I saw an insurance company the other day and they said, listen, Paul, if you introduce us to a 35-year-old female who's non-smoking, basically we could nearly afford to insure her for nothing. She won't die. Just non-smoking. Non-smoking. Very important. Uh, of females, any female born in the last five years, if we make no medical advances from today, none, no improvements, nothing, one in three of those will live to 100. Males, one in three to 96. We are truly ageing. 